here, Dr. James. Please start. Okay. Thank you very much. So, yes, as I said, that my name is uh, Jim Phillips. I work at uh, NCSA in Urbana, Illinois, uh, with the Blue Waters Project Office, which is a uh, supercomputer uh, that was first turned on, I believe, in 2012 and is still in extended operation. Uh, before that, I was the lead developer for the NAMD Molecular Dynamics program. Uh, NAMD development was funded by the U.S. National Institutes of Health uh, since the 1990s. And as a code, it really targets that health mission and uh, biomedical researchers trying to provide uh, what we call practical supercomputing. So uh, there are a large number of users who have downloaded the software. Uh, roughly 18% of them are also funded by the National Institutes of Health. And I think that you know, a lot of the people that aren't are international or non-US based uh, researchers. Many of those we consider serious users as they have downloaded more than one version of the program. And then we have scientific citations of the NAMD reference paper reflecting uh, research that has come to fruition. So the philosophy of the code is that we try to provide uh, one program that is consistent across all of the platforms that might be available to a researcher. So we have had people who come to a training session in Illinois, they bring their laptop, go through some small exercises on that, and then they can transfer that knowledge to a larger desktop in their office, a campus Linux cluster, uh, regional or national scale supercomputers, and eventually to some of the largest machines available to the scientific community. Uh, we also have for the past what, 10, 15 years now, basically since the beginning of, of uh, CUDA have been providing uh, acceleration on NVIDIA GPUs and that is starting to branch out. The goal is to take these, these scientific users who are doing biomedical research and preserve their knowledge across all of these platforms. So they don't have to change the input files, the output files are the same, and they can run any size simulation reasonably on whatever number of cores they have available. And then because our goal is to improve human health, we made the code available free of charge uh, to all users uh, for any purpose, commercial or academic. Um, I'm gonna pause at this time and mention that if you do have questions at any time during this talk, uh, please feel free uh, to interrupt. I'm happy to answer those at any time. So uh, this talk is targeted more towards um, HPC or uh, computer administration professionals, people who might support people doing the science on uh, clusters and supercomputers rather than the scientists themselves. Uh, but this gives you a little bit of background about the code. Uh, one of the unique things about NAMD is that it embeds the TCL scripting language. Um, NAMD was started uh, back in the 1990s when Python was just really starting to get off the ground. And the goal of a scripting language using a established scripting language like TCL was to enable portable innovation by the end users. So the end users are not C++ programmers. They are likely not compiling their own version of the code. We want them to be able to write scripts that they can move you know, from a laptop to a supercomputer and have the same script work. Why TCL instead of Python? Again, partly because of the age, also because TCL has had a very stable and mature package management system. The interfaces haven't changed. There hasn't been the Python two to three transition. It is an extremely simple text-based scripting language that allows you to encapsulate a variety of mini languages and express things differently. And possibly most significantly, there is a sister program to NAMD called VMD for visual molecular dynamics that is used for simulation setup 
and uh, analysis and particularly visualization that also uses TCL. So we wanted to transfer that knowledge to NAMD. And finally, it looks like a scripting language rather than a programming language. So if you're not a programmer, it's a little bit less intimidating. Uh, both NAMD and VMD now have uh, Python interfaces available, but you have to uh, compile those because we discovered people usually want to tie into the extensive Python libraries and the rest of the installation on the, sim on the system that they're running as opposed to TCL, which is very basically just driving the internal capabilities of NAMD. So I mentioned GPUs. Uh, NAMD runs quite well on NVIDIA GPUs. Um, one GPU on the order of maybe 100 CPU cores, up to maybe 10,000 atoms per GPU. Uh, with NAMD, uh, the NAMD 2 series, you must use uh, the SMP, uh, shared multiprocessor, which is basically the charm plus plus term for multiple threads, multi-threading, or multi-core, which is basically a single process multiple threads port. Um, you want multiple cores per GPU because there is uh, the integration step of the molecular dynamics algorithm as opposed to the force calculation is done on the CPU. And as GPUs have gotten faster over the years, uh, the CPUs have really become the bottleneck for most GPU accelerated systems. Um, and this is showing no signs of stopping. Uh, you also really want to use the uh, PE map core binding options uh, because when you're running very high uh, step rates, very low latency, any migration of processes by the operating system is detrimental. And there is an option plus devices that lets you specify uh, what specific GPUs uh, you want NAMD to bind to. Um, if GPU acceleration is, is slower, uh, you may be in a situation where you have a very weak GPU, say on a laptop, um, you're not using as many CPU cores as you have available. Um, also cases like coarse grain simulations tend to be integrator bound. You may just be scaling to too few atoms per GPU, or you may not have a good network. That can either be physically, you know, the network is, is just ethernet rather than something like InfiniBand, or you may be using an MPI versus a verbs port of Charm++ that we'll discuss later. Um, or there may be other features uh, that you've enabled in NAMD uh, to increase sampling, for example, that are actually the bottleneck in the simulation rather than the force calculation. Uh, GPU builds lose some features. Uh, there is an alchemical capability, which is calculating what happens if you, for example, change one atom from, say, a carbon to a nitrogen with associated hydrogens. Uh, you can do that type of uh, transformation, for example, to ask which of these molecules might bind tighter to a particular receptor, uh, methods to enhance sampling, uh, user-selected methods of specifying the energy functions. Um, but there are a lot of things that work perfectly well. Very large simulations that require memory optimization work great. Uh, anything that is merely adding small additional forces to the simulation, steering it, uh, you know, conforming the molecule to a cryoelectric microscopy, electron density grid, that all works great in the GPU force, the GPU accelerated versions of NAMD. So that's a little bit about NAMD. Um, you can't talk about NAMD without talking about the Charm++ uh, parallel programming system, and you really can't talk about Charm++ without talking about NAMD either. Uh, so Parallel Programming Lab has been uh, run by Professor uh, Laxmakant Kale, or Sanjay, uh, since the 90s. Uh, NAMD development was uh, led by uh, the late Professor Klaus Schulten, uh, starting at the same time, and they basically both ended up in Illinois, uh, started collaborating on this grand dream of uh, parallel computing for biomolecular simulations. And they've really gone up together. So the Charm++ parallel runtime system uh, shared a Gordon Bell Prize with NAMD in uh, 2002, and Klaus and Sanjay shared a 
Fernbach Award in 2012. Uh, lots of publications at supercomputing, a uh, large number of applications on the local supercomputer Blue Waters. Uh, NAMD does not use all of the latest Charm++ features simply because the NAMD architecture was developed uh, first based on what was available and then things were added on. But you can think of it as a parallel C++ with objects that are data driven. So they, you send a message to another object, that object may be on the same process, on the same thread, on a different thread, or in a different memory space, on a different physical node. That message asynchronously invokes a method, a method on that object. And those messages and the execution of the object methods are prioritized and scheduled so that uh, things happen not in a strict order, but the ordering is controlled. So higher latency sensitive operations that may require, for example, an off node response get executed before purely local calculations that don't require uh, the network. Um, this is combined with a measurement based load balancing system. So if you can measure how long each of these objects takes to execute its work every time step. There is a concept that Professor Collet calls the principle of persistence that one time step more or less looks the same as the simulation progresses. But based on those measurements, you can migrate uh, those objects around. And in principle, the Charm++ runtime system can do that migration. In practice, NAMD has its own internal load balancing mechanisms that are adapted to the specifics of the molecular dynamics decomposition. And finally, and the part that will probably you know, affect uh, you the most from a you know, NAMD installation, benchmarking, tuning, and support viewpoint is that Charm++ provides a portable messaging layer. So you have Charm++ is an API that you write to, similar to MPI, but underneath it, you can run on top of API, MPI, you can run purely locally, you can run over a normal ethernet network, and there are special optimized layers for Cray, IBM, and uh, general InfiniBand type networks. And there have been lots of those developed over the years. So actually building NAMD, pretty simple. Uh, you download the source code and uh, all of the source code releases that you can download from the NAMD website include a matching Charm++ distribution. So you get the distribution, untar it, CD into it. There is a tar file of Charm, untar that, CD into that, uh, building Charm. So the Options here are build Charm++ is a specific language. There are other uh, options that you could build or you could build everything. Charm++ is all you need. And then there is this architecture. So verbs is a InfiniBand specific API layer. Uh, Linux is the operating system. x86-64 is obviously the processor. SMP indicates a uh, multi-threaded execution. So you have uh, one communication thread in most cases, and then multiple uh, PEs, processing elements, which are basically worker threads within each memory space, within each process, and then optionally a compiler, in this case, uh, the Intel compiler ICC. Um, I like to not build the shared libraries. You can if you want to. Uh, with production, removes some of the uh, debugging features and enables all of the optimizations and then dash j8 is passed through to make to uh, build in parallel. Once you built Charm++ and it succeeds, uh, you go back out a layer and then you have to configure an AMD build. Uh, in this case, uh, Linux x 6 ICCC. Uh, those are all listed in the arch directory or if you type uh, dot slash config with no options, it will 
list everything that's available as well as all of the other options. In this case, we are using the uh, Intel math kernel library, MKL, instead of FFTW, so with MKL. And then we're specifying the charm architecture that we want to use. So the config script will automatically look in the local charm directory. Um, and there should be a directory in there from the previous build line called verbs Linux x86 64 SMP ICC. So we do that. That creates a build directory for NAMD. Go into that directory, make release dash J8, and uh, it should build. Uh, generally, Charm++ takes a little bit longer to build uh, than NAMD, uh, particularly if you're on a uh, shared file system like NFS. Uh, locally to a local disk, it should be pretty fast either way. There are just more small files that need to be created for Charm. So as I mentioned, you have to choose uh, your Charm++ build options. Generally, everything that's related to the hardware that you're running on, you choose at the Charm++ level. Uh, so your network layer, your choices are multi-core, which as I said is uh, SMP, multi-threading, but only a single process, no type of network interface. Uh, net alerts, uh, look at the net park. Alerts is a Charm++ internal lingo for low level runtime system. Uh, that will use UDP packets over either an ethernet network or a local loopback interface. Uh, so if you wanna run multiple processes on a single host, uh, that's the easiest way to do it. Um, there is the GNI layer for Cray XC and XC, uh, which allows you to run on uh, the currently released uh, generations of Cray systems, not the upcoming Shasta network. Uh, sorry, the upcoming, upcoming Shasta platform with the Slingshot network that is just being uh, deployed now. Uh, there are two layers that target InfiniBand. Verbs is the uh, best established of those. It goes back uh, probably 10 years, I'd, I'd guess. And there is a brand new uh, UCX layer. Um, the UCX layer, I'll discuss this later, has uh, some issues where it's sensitive to a bug that is in the UCX software itself. So if you want to use that, you should get higher performance, but you'll need to use uh, something newer than the released version of UCX. But those both support InfiniBand. Uh, the UCX layer was actually developed more recently with assistance from Mellanox, but it uses verbs under the covers. So the, whatever performance advantage UCX has is due to uh, some better operations in the UCX software itself rather than being low level. And finally, you can build Charm++ on top of MPI. Uh, I've always considered this a fallback option, but it will uh, save you a lot of time because it will automatically use whatever special networking hardware you have that your MPI library is already configured to use. So a lot of users, they get to a system, they wanna build NAMD, you look at the cluster documentation, it tells you how to compile an MPI program, the easiest thing to do is you build NAMD on top of Charm++ on top of MPI, and then you can follow the rest of the directions for how to run on the cluster exactly. Um, the MPI library is still used for uh, OmniPath. Uh, we had tried to develop a special layer for OmniPath, but it never really outperformed MPI, likely because the OmniPath interface matches uh, the MPI semantics very tightly. Uh, it was really designed for that. But uh, OmniPath is, is, uh, appears to be on the way out, so we won't worry about that too much. But MPI, you know, it's worth benchmarking. It works very well for non-SMP in most cases, but you really tend to see the fallback in performance with SMP builds, particularly with GPU accelerated SMP builds. So the config script will actually try to prevent you from using MPI with the SMP layer. So as I said, you have to choose SMP or the default non-SMP. Uh, the problem with the SMP layer is that you will lose one core per process as a communication thread. So 
if you only need one process per, you know, for your simulation, SMP is fine, multi-core is slightly better, but um, for, you know, many cases, particularly smaller simulations, smaller number of nodes, uh, you can be faster with non-SMP, both because you have every core in the system potentially driving communication, but also because you're not sacrificing uh, that computation core to serve as a communication core. There are other options, for example, ICC static as a compiler rather than ICC, uh, links the Intel provided libraries statically. We use this to distribute binaries because we don't wanna ship all of the shared libraries uh, that come with the Intel compiler and then have to set LD library path. Um, and again, other options for Charm++, no build shared with production. Uh, NAMD, you have a few additional choices. Most obvious, of course, you have to choose uh, the Charm++ network layer. And you, if you have built Charm++ outside of the NAMD tree, uh, you also have to tell it where to find that. So that's the Charm base option. Uh, the default is FFTW2. That's what we ship binaries with because we bought a license to do that. Uh, the NAMD license is not GPL compatible, uh, though it is uh, quite liberal. You can take 10% of the code and do whatever you want with it. Uh, you just can't redistribute uh, the entire, you know, more than that. So you can't redistribute NAMD binaries or NAMD source code. You can distribute patches. You can do lots of other things. Uh, you just can't fork the code. But uh, FFTW3 clearly has better performance. If you're building your own library, you want to use that, easy to install, um, or Intel MKL, depending on what works better on your platform. Uh, but you have to say with MKL, with FFTW3. Uh, other options. With CUDA, obvious, gets you acceleration on NVIDIA GPUs, or with Memopt. Uh, Memopt is required for extremely large simulations. Extremely large in this case means on the order of maybe 10 million atoms. Um, the largest simulations that have been done with NAMD are just over 200 million atoms. Uh, so that's pretty big. And the problem that Memopt call, the problems that the Memopt build solves are first of all startup time, because in the normal NAMD system. Uh, all of the I.O. happens on a single thread. So basically PE0 does all of the I.O. And obviously that becomes a bottleneck. Uh, Memop gets you parallel I.O. And it also uses a compressed uh, structure file that is much faster to read and does not require the same amount of peak memory that uh, the traditional NAMD infrastructure would require for very large simulations. But if you have less severe memory shortages, and again, this is a lot less of a problem now that you know you end up with you know, a quarter terabyte of memory almost by default. Um, the SMP build shares all of the structures within a process that would otherwise be distributed be duplicated across every process. So if you're running out of memory, try SMP with fewer processes on that host, but with more threads per process. Okay, so uh, the way that you launch Charm++ programs, uh, and particularly NAMD, varies as you go across platforms. So for example, multi-core, uh, you just run the NAMD2 binary directly, and if you want more than one worker thread, you specify plus P and the number of those PEs that you want to run. Uh, there is a new uh, plus auto provision option that's been added to Charm++ that will use the uh, HW lock library to try and figure out what the best way is to run on your particular node. Uh, it works well enough when it works. Um, I tend to give people the option, the instructions to control things manually because I don't completely trust it yet. Uh, the MPI build as well as the uh, UCX build and the GNI build. So 
MPI for anything, UCX, the new version for InfiniBand, or uh, GNI for the Cray systems, uh, you just follow the system launch documentation. So MPI run, MPI exec, app run, S run, whatever the instructions for your cluster or for your queuing systems specify. For uh, SMP builds, you have to specify the number of PEs per node. So plus PPNM. So if you say plus PPNM, you get two worker threads plus a communication thread for every process. So if you have 32 cores on a machine, you can run two processes with plus PPN 15 because you need to leave one core per process for that communication thread. For the other layers, particularly verbs and netlerks, you have to use a program that comes with Charm++ called Charm Run. Uh, this is obviously an analog to MPI Run. Um, for many of the layers, it's just a script that tries to call MPI Run under the hood. I rec would recommend avoiding that script. Um, it may not, you know, it might work, but it might not, and you don't really need it. Um, but for Charm Run, uh, one of the catches is that arguments that start with two plus signs are arguments to Charm Run. Arguments that start with one plus sign are arguments to uh, the NAMD2 binary itself. So those go into Charm++ plus plus for parsing, but those are arguments to NAMD2, not to Charm Run. So for Charm Run, plus plus n, and then the number of processes, and then plus plus ppn m, the number of worker threads per process, then the path to NAMD, and then the arguments for NAMD. There are older examples, and this is really new in uh, NAMD 214, the plus plus n option. Before that, you had to say plus plus p, and the total number of PEs, so you had to multiply the number of processes times the PEs per node yourself. Uh, plus plus n is simpler and more foolproof. If you have a queuing system that likes to launch MPI jobs, uh, you can have Charm++ plus plus use MPI exec, which is so much easier than trying to build node list files uh, yourself. So you just say plus plus MPI exec, and it will call MPI exec dash n with the n argument you provided. Uh, if your MPI exec does not need the dash n option, you can say M I plus plus MPI exec no n. And if you have something that is not named MPI exec, for example, um, IB run on systems at the Texas Advanced Supercomputer Center or S run on Slurm, you can also use the plus plus remote shell S run option. And uh, that generally works. Uh, Charm++ recognizes the environment variables that uh, the various MPI launchers uh, use. Um, and if you're just running on a single host, you can just say Charm Run++ plus plus local. And that will simply fork NAMD processes locally rather than launching them on other nodes. As I mentioned, Two plus signs, charm run, one plus sign, uh, argument to NAMD2. Uh, the only exception is plus lowercase p for legacy reasons. So uh, the NAMD command line itself is pretty consistent. Uh, you want to specify a uh, PE map, which basically binds every PE, that is every worker thread, to a specific core. Um, the numbers uh, that are used here are the ones that you will see if you look at top, for instance. Um, they are system logical uh, core numbers. And you can just give it a range with a stride. The stride can have a run attached. And then you can also do um, offsets. So that gets more interesting for Intel systems that have um, processor orders that, that alternate between uh, the sockets on the machine. So we'll see that example with the uh, KNL later. I should note that NAMD214 with Charm++ 610 introduces logical uh, CPU IDs for PE maps. 
Uh, you access those by putting a capital L in front of the uh, string. So plus PE map L zero to seven will use the HW lock logical processor indices. Uh, you need to provide on the NAMD command line, uh, the path to the NAMD simulation config file. This is usually named something either .namd or .conf. Um, and you can also add options to the command line by predecessing them with dash dash. Uh, NAMD is not case sensitive for its internal options. Um, when you look at the file, you'll be surprised it's TCL. Trust me, it is. There's just some little uh, magic under the hood for making arguments uh, case insensitive. And uh, things are treated as if they were concatenated. So if you have an option before a run command, it'll get processed. If it's after that, um, NAMD might run the whole simulation before reading that argument. So the order on the command line matters. And uh, one of the, the neat things is that all of the path files are relative to where that config file is. So if I have, say, a benchmark file in, you know, home gym tests, you know, virus 32 run.namd, and I say namd2 home gym tests virus 32 run.namd, all of the input files will be found because they are relative to that .namd file, which is very convenient as opposed to having to CD and get all the paths right. So a couple of tips. Um, first of all, as I said, uh, avoid using the network layer. I'm not gonna tell you not to test it. It might be better uh, for some cases uh, and it's worth testing, but in general, uh, you should probably not, uh, but again, test it, uh, except on OmniPath when we don't have a better option. Uh, but we wrote the low level layers because we believe they're faster. You will particularly see that with uh, SMP and GPU accelerated builds. Do use Charm++, start up with Charm Run++ MPI exec and the other options. For larger simulations on larger node counts, the SMP builds have an advantage. Uh, they can do some message aggregation within a process that accelerates uh, the parallel fast Fourier transform for uh, particle mesh AWALD. Uh, they also reduce your memory usage, but again, you're giving up that communication threat. Do set the processor affinity as I noted. Um, so you need to set both for the PEs and for the communication threads. And for this case, you have seven with two processes on each host. That's why you have two communication threads and two PE maps. Um, I've seen cases where people have measured very good scaling simply because um, all of the threads were sharing the same core, just because that's the way the operating system or the queuing system had, had bound things and uh, absolute performance was bad. Um, in many cases, as you're getting to larger node counts, reserving one core for the operating system definitely helps. Cray has an option for this. Most clusters, you would just not use every core on the node. When you are benchmarking NAMD, um, if you have a real science problem, you definitely want to benchmark the real science on the machine that you want to use. You don't want to use you know, some benchmark that you downloaded off the NAMD website or something you happen to have sitting around and use that to infer how you should run a specific simulation. If people are gonna be running a campaign for a month, it's worth spending a few hours trying to tune the options to improve that performance. Um, don't time overall execution, first of all, because that includes startup and load balancing, which are very sensitive to things like the file system. Um, and, you know, load balancing takes a little bit longer on larger, node counts, but you only really have to do it at the beginning. So what you really want is the marginal cost of an additional nanosecond. So um, you wanna do something better. You need the first 500 to 1000 steps just to get the load balance measured. Remember for CPU based runs, this is a measurement based load balancer. 
and just to you know basically get any transient uh, performance effects worked out. Um, at the beginning of the run, you will see LDB for load balance outputs. Um, and it will print several lines that say benchmark time. And those include uh, the timing information that you need. There are also timing lines. Uh, you should only be interested in the wall clock time. Uh, the CPU time is mostly just measuring the first process. Um, <clears throat> and be sure to, of course, benchmark the longest running part of the simulation. A lot of users will take their system, minimize it to, to get it basically from any uh, unstable initial configurations, and then run uh, that for you know a thousand steps maybe, and then they start the dynamics that they're planning on running for you know 10 million, 100 million time steps. After that, you don't want to benchmark minimization. You want to get an equilibrated system, benchmark and tune that. So let's see. I'm going to stop uh, at this point and just uh, check if there are any questions. I think this is, is uh, going a little bit longer than I had uh, anticipated, but I think this is good material. Okay, uh, hearing none, I will move forward. Yes? Yes, um, no questions. Yeah. Okay, so just to show a little bit more about how this uh, PI, P, PE binding and communication thread binding works. Uh, these are two examples from uh, Intel's KNL processors a couple of years ago. Uh, ALCF Argon's Theta machine was using 64 core processors on an Ares network. Uh, Texas built a machine with the 68 core processor model on OmniPath. So you can see the build options. Um, but I, what I want you to notice is the, you know, the difference in the number of uh, tasks per node that we were running. So for the Cray system, we have a very good uh, network layer for, for Cray Aries, works very well with uh, large numbers of worker threads per core. So we're running PPN 16 with only with seven processes per KNL node versus TAC, uh, the OmniPAC network layer didn't work that well. So we were only running um, eight threads per process with 13 processes per node. So different. And then uh, you can see the plus option because the way the threads were numbered, um, on a single core, you would have threads, for example, 0, 64, 128, and 196 on, on theta. So that plus 64 interleaves those so that we would have threads for the same process on the same core. And that basically allows them to share uh, their shared data structures better without overloading cache and keeping multiple copies of the same data in cache. Uh, so the reasoning there behind that was we want to leave a core free to isolate OS noise. We have lots of cores on Core now. Um, we want pairs of cores um, from the same process to be on, a, on the same tile. So we, we want to keep the P's in the same process sort of nearby. Uh, one or two hyper threads per core. Uh, was sufficient for KNL, and more or fewer COM threads per host. And then those specific numbers basically come down to how do we fit all of these things. So for example, take 64, serve one for the operating system, that leaves 63. What are, you know, how many PEs and how many communication threads can we have? Well, it turns out that uh, seven processes per node gets us two more worker threads. Um, but adding, you know, going down to four processes per node doesn't get us any more. So we sort of picked that uh, seven processes per node as a sweet spot, and then similar for KNL. Uh, final notes, as I mentioned, there is this new UCX layer uh, that tends to outperform uh, the, traditional verbs layer on InfiniBand. 
Uh, these are a couple examples. Note here that when I say one PPN, that's one process per node. And uh, the first thing to note is that you know having one process per node doesn't you know tend to scale very well. This is uh, GPU accelerated. Um, you you want to have one process per GPU, uh, really just to get enough communication threads working uh, to really drive the network. And the other thing you should note here is that you know this is logarithmic on the x-axis, linear on the y-axis, so you are, this is not great scaling. Um, basically the, the GPU version for this benchmark, I was trying to show the difference in uh, network performance. If we go to the CPU part of the Frontera cluster, uh, we see better scaling. So now we're seeing you know, what, what looks a little bit closer. Um, and again, we see the, the same effect that having more processes per node gives us those extra CPUs, cores driving the network. Um, but you know, there's, there's a trade-off point. I only went up to four. Um, but we can also see, you know, so four for, UCX is somewhat better than four for verbs, uh, but those are you know, both better than two, and those are, of course, both better than one. And you see, you know, we sort of fall over in scaling. Um, so you really sort of see these performance differences at the extreme. I'm not sure what exactly is going on uh, with the UCX layer here. Um, this is a... a several months old. I think this, I ran this data back in March. Uh, there have been some enhancements to the UCX layer. But again, this is, you know, why you have to benchmark. And it might be that for a specific system with a specific uh, input set, UCX or verbs or even MPI might actually be your better performing option. Uh, we do have an issue on Frontera, uh, which is the, the largest uh, sort of recent generation InfiniBand cluster that we have access to, uh, where we see hangs. You run you know, for a while, a little hang after a few minutes or an hour, uh, which is very bad because the job continues running and the machine is idle. So uh, we've tracked this down. We believe it is an issue not in Charm++ or NAMD, but in the UCX library itself. Uh, there is a UCX181 release candidate out. It's not fixed in, but the branch that we, the patch that we believe fixes it is in both uh, UCX master and uh, the 1.9x branches of UCX. You can download and, and build that yourself from there. Uh, there is a term plus plus issue tracking this and you have uh, full public access to that GitHub uh, repository and that's the issue number. So uh, NAMD 2.14 beta 2 is out. Uh, 2.14 itself should be released imminently. We are just have a couple of uh, minor, one minor issue uh, that we want to make sure doesn't break anything when we fix it. Uh, hopefully that'll be out this week or next. Uh, there are a couple of good improvements that will be merged after 2.14 into the NAMD 2 mainline. The first is uh, support for AMD GPUs. Uh, I mentioned in the beginning that we have an early science project on the Oak Ridge Frontier machine that is uh, a Cray system with uh, both AMD processors, both AMD CPUs and AMD GPUs. So this is support for the AMD's HIP API. Uh, there is also contributed by Intel uh, tile-based kernel supporting AVX 512. Um, these were initially developed for KNL, uh, but we're now you know, looking at, at supporting uh, Skylake and future generations. So those are both available if you want to take a look at them in the uh, NAMD repository. And finally, a lot of work in the past couple of years has gone into uh, moving the last of the bottlenecks off of the CPU onto the GPU for CUDA accelerated NAMD. And this has been declared the breakpoint for NAMD 3.0. Uh, there is currently an alpha release of NAMD 3.0 uh, 
with the caveat that it only works uh, for single process runs. So you can have um, multiple GPUs per host, all accessed with that single process. Uh, that works. For example, they have a uh, DGX2 that they've been doing uh, testing and development on. Um, but for a lot of simulations that are using uh, multi-copy algorithms, where you're basically running very, you know, more roughly the same simulation, the same system with a small tweak or just pure multiple copies um, across a larger machine, uh, that works perfectly fine. So you can build, for example, an MPI version of Nambi 3, but you can only have one process per replica, whereas normal NAMD, you can have uh, as many as you want. So in conclusion, I just need to acknowledge again the two groups that have contributed to this. Um, Klaus Schulten's former group at the Beckman Institute at the University of Illinois, the NIH Center for Macromolecular Modeling and Bioinformatics, uh, currently run by Ahmad Tashkorshid, and uh, then Professor Kale's Parallel Programming Laboratory at the Department of Computer Science, as well as the various funding agencies and uh, US national labs that have provided machine time and assistance over the years. So thank you very much. Are there any questions now? Hello? Okay, I have questions in the chat. So the one question was, is the TCL functionality included in Charm++? Plus Plus? Um, it is not included in Charm++. Plus Plus. It is most likely already available uh, on your Linux distribution. So TCL is, is pretty standard and there are uh, various Linux utilities that use it. So uh, if you don't have uh, TCL, you can either uh, just install uh, TCL and TCL Devel. Um, there are also on the NAMD download, I should say, on the NAMD webpage, there is a link to pre-compiled TCL libraries uh, that work with NAMD. Uh, so you can just download those. But T TCL is is widely available. So if you check, check user lib, lib TCL, it's probably there. Or just type TCLSH and see what happens. Okay. Well, it is 10 minutes to the hour, so the question about the recording of the session is not for me. I believe it is being recorded. I can send a PDF of the slides.
Mr. James. I think there are no more questions. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, thank you, Dr. James, for your great presentation, and thank you, everyone, for attending today's session. The link to the recording of this session will be sent to your mailbox today. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Bye-bye.